Um, WA win is it for you guys next week? This week, next next week, next week. After yet, wow, life is great. Two more weeks. Okay, there about. So we went to collate the date. So we roughly found out and we realized that earliest was this week. So we wanted to just get the WA revision underway, even though your WA is probably next week or the week after. I know they have been complaints. Sure, can cover waves or not. So it was a debate whether to do waves, light and static. But in all honesty, if I only have two hours with you guys, covering three chapter can one. I can do anything. But what's the level of detail that we'll be able to go into, right? So we decided uh, based on populace, that means everybody we vote, right? We realized that the highest overlap was light and static. Waves, um, the good news is that in our own tuition class, we did cover as well. Uh. So after putting all the factors together, we are covering two main topics today. One very big one in light, one very scary one in static. So after today's class, what I'm hoping I can do for you is that if these topics are being tested for your WA, you at least have a lot more clarity. On top of that, we have picked out a couple of questions that we felt were commonly tested slash challenging enough for us to discuss. So this session is going to be take about two hours, plus minus. We'll go for a break in the middle. So once we are done with light, which will take us about an hour plus, we'll take a short break. We'll come back again for static. Okay, so here's the important question, including those in the chat, right? I want to know, uh, can you do the thumbs up feature if you have learned light in school or you have started on it? That means like somewhat your school has already been teaching it. Let me know now. So those here, light, have you done light in school? Yes. Okay, based on what I see on my screen, I just see a gazillion thumbs up. So I'm going to go with the assumption that everybody here has more or less learned light. All right, what about static? So those that have learned static, can you put the thumbs up so I know? No, not yet. Not yet. Here? Only a couple, all right? Okay, so I'll say pretty clear what's going to happen is that for light, I'm going to go with the assumption that you guys have learned it before. So it allows me to go more in depth. For static, if you are not tested on it or today is like not relevant for your WA, just take it as a, you know, you pre-learn it, right? So I'll emphasize on the key points as well as to go through the questions. Now, those online, obviously, I can't bring the worksheet for you. So, hey, no worries. You can sit first row. <laughs> okay, the worksheet is here. Okay, yeah. So what's going to happen is that for light, we can go in depth, all right? So without further ado, let's jump straight in. Starting with the chapter. So those physically here, you should have the handout. Those that are online, I hope you printed your own or you're doing it on your iPad. Now, just remember that this session, right, you can ask questions. Right? That means if you have questions, treat it like a normal class. Ask well. Those here, raise your hand. Those that are online, just uh, type it in the chat. All right. So if you're late for physical, no worries. Just make your way here. I I'm waiting for you. I printed in our worksheets. No worries. Okay. Worry. okay. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's do the actual revision. Now, for light, there are three subtopics within light. Reflection, refraction, as well as lenses. Amongst the three, I would say refraction and lens is usually where it's more challenging. But as we also understand reflection, there are a couple of question types that is a bit more difficult. I will not be going through the whole thing in very great detail. We are talking about key points of emphasis. Now, first thing we need to pay attention to Two laws of reflection, I'm going to go with the assumption that you know it, right? It's quite common sense. It's not something too difficult. Same thing as I told my regular class, I want to highlight to you where you might potentially be making a careless mistake. So you must always remember that when we are looking at angle of incidence, it is always between the light ray and the normal. Okay, so between the light ray and the normal itself, this angle that exists between the two is your angle of incidence. I want you to think one step ahead. I want you to recognize that the school, instead of giving you this angle of incidence, they would like to give you, oh, 50 degrees here, right? But it is on you, uh, the onus is on you to make sure that, hey, I'm not going to be tricked by this. I'm going to focus on reminding myself it's always between the light ray and the normal. So emphasize that, make sure you don't make this careless mistake. So you'll always be using the correct angle instead. Other than that, the law is simple. So I'm telling you, don't fall into the trap hole. Okay, there's no careless mistake. Huh? You're supposed to know that you'll make this careless mistake. Other than that, reflection is pretty clear cut. Later on in the practice, there's a couple of interesting questions. All right, so we'll take a look at it later. Now, for ray diagram, 
it's very important for you to understand the correct steps towards drawing it. Now, if you trust me, just write this down. Always, always uh, draw the image first. This means regardless of what question you're solving, as long as it's a plain mirror image question, your job is to always draw in the image. If you don't draw in the image, you're screwed like in short. Those online... Wait, uh, let me adjust my mic again. I feel like it's not being detected. Wait, uh, wait, uh. Technical difficulties. This is weird. Sorry. So I bought a um, real good phone in hopes that this will give you high quality audio. Is the audio a bit better? Those online, can you let me know? I can't hear my own voice because I changed it to my other microphone. Yes, yes, much better. There you go. Now it's DJ quality. No, I bought this because I used to do podcast and we're going to restart the podcast. So it's like the audio quality needs to be crisp. Yeah, so this is like a $200 microphone. But hey, it's worth the money, okay? Okay, anyway, uh, for a re diagram question, make sure we always draw in the image first. Now, what's the reason why we are emphasizing on it? It's because without it, the light rays that you're drawing are all nonsense. In short, right? Uh, why is this not working? Oh, anyway, I want to share one good news with you guys today. To tell, do you know what happened today? You got no, you don't have any news? Are you in Gerald's class? You know, you're only in Jason's class, right? Oh, okay, never know. The baby came today. Yay, so exciting. Yeah, so we're just like spazzing over it this morning. But hey, all is good. Sorry, 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 sorry. Any of Gerald's students here? Please go and congratulate them. Congratulate him. Yes. Okay. Sorry, I, I really try to fix this microphone situation. Then uh, once it's done, uh, hopefully it won't come back to bother us again. Mm. This is a problem. Eh? Oh, guys, how we cancel class? Ah? My USB port, my USB thing not working now. Hmm. But if I keep plugging, it's not like it's gonna get detected though. Uh, now it's okay. Ah. you can still hear. I mean, I just do not know about the quality of the microphone. Lah. But if you can hear me, then it's okay. Lah. If you're, if you're, uh, those online, you help me do a simple test. Ah. Oh, this is okay? Okay, lah, can, lah, can, lah. you can hear me good then, okay. All right, sorry, let's move on. Uh, I saw a question in the chat just now. So do we measure first, measure the distance of the image from the mirror? Absolutely. So when I say draw in the image, the way to do so is to measure the distance from the image to the mirror then from the mirror, you should be able to draw in the position of your image. That has to come first. Okay, Everything else, the construction of light rays, how it reflects off the mirror, is following after you have drawn in the image. So just remember, for any plain mirror image question, you have to draw in the image as your first step. Later, when we solve questions, this will become more apparent. Okay, But for now, we're just covering content as a bit of a recap. Now, the things that you need to memorize or will be tested in a very simple plane form is what are the characteristics of your plane mirror image. I'll say one of the key things to highlight here, when we are tasked to define a virtual image, just remember the official definition is that it cannot be captured on a screen. Okay, There is no definition, virtual means not real. Not real means virtual, no, that was nonsense. Okay, Real is real, virtual is virtual. If we use a similar phrasing, how do we define a real image? A real image can be captured on a screen. A virtual image cannot. So just imagine you have a mirror and if you put a projector screen behind the mirror, you're not going to get an image. 
everything in the mirror plane is doesn't exist, right? It's virtual. But for an actual projector, when you shine light from the projector onto the screen, you actually capture the image. That is a real image. This will become more apparent when we cover lenses later. All right. So other than that, the rest are pretty clear cut. Image is upright, same size, laterally inverted, and same distance. These are the easy stuff, all right? So we're not going to spend too long on this. Let's move on to the next bit. Okay, for refraction, refraction, I do want to slow down a little here to make sure that we are clear in terms of how we remember the whole process. Now, first thing we need to understand is why do light rays bend? The reason why light rays bend is because of the difference in the speed of light. Okay, wait, I better mute first. Mute for one bit. Okay. All right, so it's because light travels faster in certain optical mediums and slower in the other. That's why the light ray will bend. Are you here for the physics revision? The worksheet is here, free seating. So in order to help you remember a little better, we have a very important tip that I want you all to pick up today. In the faster medium, we bend away from the normal. In the slower medium, we bend towards the normal. So just very simply remember the acronym FAST. Faster, that means you're in air, you will bend away from the normal. This means if you're traveling from water to air, faster, right? You're going into somewhere faster, you bend away. If you're going into somewhere slower, you bend towards the normal. So just remember the acronym F-A-S-T. Fast, away. Slow, towards. All right, so this is comparing before and after you enter the medium. All right, later on, we will then talk about the different definitions and the different formulas related to it. All right, so let's move on. Um, this is the ray diagram for real depth or parent depth. I won't spend too long talking about this, uh, but in general, what we should always draw is to always draw in the image first. After that, you will trace the light ray from the image in a straight line to the person's eye, and then you then trace the correct light ray from the actual object into the person's eye. Something quite helpful for us to recognize here is that realize that the light ray always enters the eye. Right? While this might sound like common sense, some of us will draw the arrow shooting out from the eye. Uh. Remember, we are not cyclops, right? We don't shoot out laser beams from the eye. If anything, we always see things because light ray is entering our eyes. Okay. Other than that, let's move on. This is the part where I do want to slow down a little as it can get quite potentially confusing. Now, I'm going to throw it to everybody in the chat and in present here. Any of your schools taught Snell's Law? We see a couple of hands. The rest online, how many of y'all? Can y'all just let me know in the chat? So Ritik, you learn Snell's Law in school. The rest? Anybody else? Okay, I want to be absolutely clear here. Snell's Law is officially outside of O-level syllabus. However, it is totally possible for a prelim question to provide you with Snell's Law's formula and therefore you are required to solve questions on Snell's Law. So in short, right, can you be tested? Yes, but they must give you all the information to work with. So in short, do you think you should be prepared for Snell's Law? I think so, all right? But as I said before, it is technically not within O-level syllabus. Here's the good and bad news. We're gonna do a question on it later. So at least you got a tiny bit of exposure. If it really comes out for your WA, you will not be completely destroyed by it. So that's the main goal. All right, but the one that's more important for us is definitely the n is equals to sine i over sine r or sine r over sine i. Now, for my own students, I have already emphasized this to you last. Sorry, I need to mute again. So I already mentioned this to you last week. There are occasions where we need to use sine i over sine r. There are reasons why we use sine r over sine i. In short, it gets very confusing, right? When do I use sine i over sine r? When do I do the other way around? Oh, from air to denser, from denser to air. 
So in short, right, I have summarized it to make it a lot easier to remember. I want you guys to write this down in the empty space here. Yeah? N is equals to sine air over sine medium. If you do this, you do not have to worry whether it's I over R or R over I. I've always wanted to bring up the fact that your refractive index will always be a value bigger than 1. The angle in air will always be a larger value than the angle in the medium. So in short, if you have a numerator and a denominator, we always put the bigger number on top. So your sign in air, your angle in air, is confirm bigger than your angle in your medium. So if you flip it around, right, something's off, right? Because now if you calculate n, your value will be smaller than 1. And that's a problem. All right. So in short, just remember, you always put the big value over the small value because the value of n has to be bigger than 1. The angle in air will always be bigger than the angle in the medium. If you follow this rule, you will be safe. So regardless of i over r or r over i, forget it. Right? Just do air over medium, you'll be safe. So later, we'll try to apply this logic to the questions that we'll do. There's two other formulas for refractive index. Other than using the formula that we have just outlined here, sine air over sine medium, Sorry. This is the first formula, right? We also have the formula speed of light in vacuum over speed of light in medium, real depth over apparent depth. So I also want you all to take a moment to highlight this part, right? Refractive index must at least be one or greater. This means that when we are looking at speed of light in vacuum versus speed of light in medium, which one is a larger or faster? Is faster in vacuum or your medium? Definitely faster in your vacuum, right? Because it's a big numerator over a smaller denominator. Real depth or parent depth? Which one is a larger value? Real depth, right? Because once again, your numerator must be bigger so that you get a value bigger than one for n. So in short, uh, don't need to memorize anything. Right? Just remember, it's always the big value over the small value. Okay, if you ever do it the other way around, your n value will be smaller than 1, then that is a red flag. That means, eh, wrong already. I need to pause and regroup myself. So there are a total of three formulas. I'm just saying that it's always big over small. Now, do you need to remember the speed of light in vacuum? What do you think? Answer is yes. Ah. So you're supposed to know it is 3 times 10 to a power of 8. Right? In fact, after a while, you kind of get it. I don't think this is one of those things you need to hard call memorize per se. Okay, if not, the last bit that we really need to talk about in detail is the idea of total internal reflection. Now, total internal reflection is a phenomenon. I'll call it an extension of refraction. So if you keep doing refraction, you'll end up getting total internal reflection. Now, it's a bit difficult for me to talk about this, so I have to refer back to the curated notes for, my, for some help, but it's talking about the same concept. If you want to, you can take a photo, you can copy down, or if you have the physics curated notes, it's already inside. So no worries on that. Now, let's talk about a few things first. I want you all to focus on this angle here and this angle here. The medium in which the eye is in is in the glass, right? So this is something with a higher optical density. It is slow. Remember what does the acronym FAST mean? We try to get an F. Faster, right? Faster. A is away, right? S, slower. Two words, right? So I want you all to think, as I go from glass to air, am I going into somewhere faster or slower? It's definitely faster, right? Because speed of light in air is much faster. So it's faster what's going to happen to the light rays behavior. It's going to bend away, right? And is this true when we observe the behavior of this light ray? It's true, right? Because as we observe it, it bends away from the normal. The angle has increased. So this is just a classic case of refraction. Angle in air is bigger than the angle in glass. Now, let's imagine if I continue to increase the angle, what do I mean? So instead of drawing the light ray here, just imagine I draw the... Sorry, my, my drawing not very good. Uh. I need to confess first, but I'll try my best. 
So imagine I draw my angle like that. Okay, that means my light ray is coming in. Can you see I've increased my angle here? So realistically, what's going to happen to my refracted ray? It is going to bend away even more. So I'm sort of like pushing it to the limit, right? Because we know it bends away, but if I keep increasing my angle in my glass, the angle in air is only going to get bigger. And what happens if I keep pushing the light ray's angle in the glass to keep increasing? It will eventually reach a point, right? Where my refracted ray is 90 degree to the surface. So this is the limit already. If I continue pushing this by just a bit more, what's going to happen? Total internal reflection will take place. So in short, we call this angle the critical angle. Why is it so critical? It's because if you exceed the critical angle, that means if I go beyond, total internal reflection will occur. Right. So you guys know your parents as well, right? Sometimes, you know, they neck you, neck you, you talk back a little bit, okay, right? When you talk back, you know that there will be this point, right, where it hits the critical point, huh? after that, whoa, bro, you do not want to know the consequences, right? So you know you can chip back at them, make them piss a bit, but you cannot go beyond this point. So that is the critical point, you know that that's the limit. Before that, it's just a normal refraction, right? But if you go past this critical point, it's GG already. So the GG in our case, is total internal reflection will take place. So here's the thing. There is a formula to calculate how much is this critical angle. You can copy down this formula, or you can also write down n is equals to 1 over sine c. It's the same thing. It's just math. Huh? We're just rearranging the formula here. But something that I would say is a lot more important to impress upon you, do you still remember what I've literally just taught you? N is equals to sine air, right? Over sine medium. I want you to observe this scenario over here. What's my angle in air? It's sine 90, right? So just write that down, sine 90. What's my angle in my medium? It's sine C, right? And y'all don't take out your calculator, please. How much is sine 90? It's 1, right? So in short, are you able to see that the formula n is equals to 1 over sine c is because the angle in air is 90. So while you can insist that, oh, this is another formula I need to memorize, the truth is that if you are well-versed with sine air over sine medium, sine 90 is 1. Lah. So that's how you get this formula. You can inverse sign afterwards to figure out what's your critical angle. If you want a life hack, uh, I'm going to tell you now, uh, your refractive index of glass is usually 1.5. The critical angle is usually 41.8 or 42 in short. So most likely if your WA comes out, half the time is glass. More than half the time actually, like 70% of the time is glass. So the value of 42 will be quite helpful. Uh. But this one a bit play cheat. Lah. This is reverse engineering. Okay? You are supposed to calculate this on your own. But I'm just letting you know you'll see the number 42 more often than not. Okay, So this is how it works. In short, if we go back now to the handout, I want you all to clearly know that there are two conditions that needs to be fulfilled for total internal reflection to take place. First thing, it has to travel from optically denser to optically less dense medium. And the angle of incidence must be greater than critical angle. I can bet you 20 cents that this one will probably be tested for your WA. All right. In short, right, if total internal reflection is tested and there's ever a explain, right, explain how did total internal reflection occur, you are almost required, guarantee, uh, to bring up the two conditions. Right? But maybe if your question is glass and air, you can replace optically denser medium in glass, optically less dense medium in air. So you answer specific to the question. Right? And if you know your critical angle, you can also mention it. But I'm saying that the two conditions are almost 100% required. All right? And I believe with a certain degree of understanding, this is not something that we need to memorize completely, but it makes sense in context to whatever we have discussed over here. Right, we keep pushing the limit until it hits 90. That's the critical angle. Anything more than that, total internal reflection occurs.
the one application or what you're required to know for total internal reflection, sorry, not over here, we'll see in the question later, is your optic fiber. So you know nowadays you get 4G, 5G, right? All of this is via the optic fiber. There is a question that is very complex combined with Snell's law later that we'll go through together, okay? So today we will do practices because content alone is not going to be useful, all right? But take it one step at a time, all right? So when we come to this, we'll talk about it. The last bit that I want to cover with you properly is lenses. After this, we can move on to the questions and the discussion. There are two types of lenses that you're required to know, the converging and diverging lens. Converging means to converge. The light rays will bend inwards. They will come together, converge, right? Divergence means they will bend away from one another. Later, we'll look at a couple of scenarios where this applies. But to be honest, the real important bit about lenses is the ability to draw in your light rays. So for those that haven't printed your worksheet, please do, because you need a bit of a practice. And later, we purposely chose a question where there's drawing involved. The two light rays that you must know very, very well, I call them light ray 1 and light ray 2. Okay? The light ray 1 is a straight line that cuts through the optical center. This is the easiest light ray to draw because every single lens, no matter what scenario, will always have this light ray. The optical center refers to the center of the lens. So the, this light ray has to cut through the center. The second light ray that I say is more important. The third one is not as important. The second one is traveling parallel. And the moment it passes through the lens, it will cut through F. Oh, I highlight until very ugly, but whatever, lah, you guys get it, can read it. Okay, these two light rays is a must know. Because wherever these two light rays converges, that is where the image will be formed. In short, you should be going into your WA with obviously a pencil and a ruler because you will be expected to draw certain light ray. I know some of you go school, I'll bring one pen one. Don't even have calculator, please. Uh. Physics, you need all the tools you can get. All right. Light ray treat is not say that it's not important, but it's very, very low usage rate. So if anything today, I just need you to focus on the first two light ray. Those will be the two that will be drawing as well. Where the two light rays intersect is where the image will be formed. Okay? Other than that, let's move on. Okay, now, all of these guidelines for ray diagram drawing, I need you to look at this in conjunction with the diagrams that you see over here in your curated notes. Don't worry, because this is the same set of diagrams that we put out from the textbook. But I want you to take note that the way I have sequenced the light ray is different from your school. I want to be absolutely clear why that is necessary. Take note, where is my first diagram starting at? We're starting at 2F. Okay, so observe this. Observe this. Okay, just look, uh, don't need to copy anything because you already have the diagrams, right? If you don't, don't worry, I can send you a screenshot of this later. I need y'all to pay attention here because whatever I'm about to teach you next, your school quite likely won't teach you one. Okay, so you listen here, you learn it well. Now, the reason why we start studying our lenses with 2F is because it's the easiest light ray diagram to learn. Meaning, object is at 2F, image is at 2F. So I like to call this the 2F, 2F. It's equidistant from the lens. The size of the image is the same. It's just inverted. So this is literally what we call your photocopier, right? It's a one-for-one -one exact replica of each other. Now, the thing that I'm going to teach you next is quite smart. I need you to be able to see it with me. I want you to take a look at this triangle that I'm drawing and this triangle that I'm drawing. What can you say about these two triangles? Don't tell me it's right angle. Yes, it's right angle. What else? Similar. To be more precise, it's congruent, right? But why can we definitely say that these two are congruent? What are the rules for congruency? A, 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 right? But that could be similar as well, right? Take a look. Huh? This is 2F. This is I become your math teacher like that. This is 
2f as well, right? So the point I'm trying to make is that this two, uh, con shit, I cannot spell congruent. G R. Oh, yeah, thanks. Sorry, I'm not math teacher. Okay, but my main point is that these two are the exact same triangle, which means if you think about it in terms of the height of the image, it will be the exact same height. Now, uh, we try to build upon this idea a bit further. We take a look at the next diagram. The object now is at a distance more than 2f. Can you see? 2f is here, the object is here. So this diagram here is more than 2f. Observe the triangle that we're constructing now. What about this other triangle? Are they congruent already? No longer, right? But which triangle is smaller? It's quite clear, right? The one on the right side is smaller. So that what will happen to the size of the image now? It's smaller. You get it? So the point I'm trying to make is that if you take 2f and 2f as your reference point, imagine you shift the object further away from the lens. It's going to form a bigger triangle which means that image that you're forming will be a smaller triangle. It's still inverted, it's still real, but it is now diminished. If you bring across the same idea now, and we push the object closer towards the lens, I want you to now observe that this triangle that you're forming is smaller, right? Because now the lengthwise is no longer 2F, it's shorter than that, which means the triangle that you form over here, can see, it is bigger. So what does that tell you about the image size that we're going to be getting? It's going to be magnified. So in short, if you can see how triangles work to your advantage in lenses, you have already tackled three lens diagrams all at once, simply by shifting the triangle left and right. Bigger, smaller, right? So the distance from the lens gives you an idea whether the image will be smaller or bigger. All right, in short, if my image is closer to the lens, my image size will be bigger or smaller. Image, uh, image is closer to the lens. It's smaller, right? Because if it's closer, the triangle that you can form is smaller. But if my image is located further away from the lens, because I push my object closer to the lens, the triangle for my image will be bigger. That's why it will be magnified. That's all. That's all I'm saying. So there's nothing to memorize here, but rather just see and understand how it works. Once you see it, you cannot unsee it. But trust me, a lot of people don't see it, okay? I'm pretty sure you all learn lens in school already, right? Any of your teacher mentioned this? Bruh, so learn it here, learn it well, okay? I will say this will really help you in the long run by reducing the amount of things you need to memorize. Now, with that being said, i like to address one tiny point on real versus virtual. We try again, huh? What's the definition of a real image? What thing, what thing? Can be captured on the screen, right? In relation to your diagram here, if your two light rays converges, that means they cut across and it forms an image, that image is real. So if I erase away all of these triangles, can you see over here? This light ray one and light ray two, they do cut across one another. If that happens, you get a real image. We do a very quick run through. Let's take a look at this fourth diagram over here. Did my light rays converge? Did they cut across each other? If not, what is my image? It is virtual. We take a look at this one. Did these two light rays cut across one another? It didn't, right? Cutting behind doesn't count. Huh? It must be the real light rays cutting across. If it didn't, it is virtual. Did my two light rays converge? The last diagram. Yes, right? Which means my image is real. So whether it's real or virtual, once again, no need to memorize one. Just think about your light ray diagram. Did the light rays converge? Did they cut one another? If they did, real. If they didn't, it is virtual. That's all you need to do. Okay, so for the second and third one, just as a very quick recap, all we are saying is that if you move your object further away from the lens, instead of having it at 2f, you had it further away from 2f. Based on similar triangles, we need to understand that the object now forms the larger triangle. Your image will now be located between f and 2f. 
So with it being a smaller triangle, the image will be diminished. But if you push your object closer towards the lens, where the object exists between F and 2F, the triangle that the image form is bigger, and therefore the image size will be larger. That's all. Okay, so all we are saying here is how we can use similar triangles to visualize the size of my image better. All right, the remaining three, I'll just power through it because I would say it's pretty clear cut. For this one here, because after bending, the light rays travel parallel, these two, they will never cut. We get a virtual image. This is most similar to using a torch light or, you know, in a the stadium, they got spotlights. You don't really form an image. It just shows light onto a certain area. That's all. This one is not that commonly tested. The surprising one that's tested a lot uh, is your magnifying glass. Magnifying glass get tested a lot. Okay, so for magnifying glass, take note that the object is placed so freaking close to the lens uh, is even lesser than F. Remember, we started at 2F. That is the same size. But if you push it so close to the lens, the only way for the light ray or the image to form is by converging backwards. So you actually draw a dotted line tracing from the two points backwards to locate where the image will be formed. All right? At IEP level, integrated program level, they actually learn how to calculate the magnification. Good and bad news, at O-level, you're not supposed to know it. But what can they do? They can give you the formula and you're supposed to solve it as a question. Has it came out in O-level before? Yes. Once. But will we prepare well for it? Obviously. Lah. But my point is magnification, meaning if I use a magnifying glass, how many times bigger is my image? Actually kind of makes sense. Lah. Imagine your object is 1 cm, then your image is 4 cm. What's the magnification? Four times, lah. that's it. So there's actually a formula to calculate it, but it's not as complex as you think it is. Okay, so that's more or less what you need to know about magnifying glass. I want you all to pay attention to where you draw the solid lines and the dotted lines. In short, it's best to remember the dotted lines as what we call contraction lines. That means I'm using it so that I can locate where my image is. The real light rays are then drawn with solid lines. Lastly, if it's a virtual image, please make sure to draw it with dotted lines instead. All right. Lastly, if your object is coming from very, very far away, for example, another planet, a uh, meteorite in the space, and you want to see it, right? Sorry. All right. So the light rays actually come in, they will actually bend, and you'll capture the image. So this is the object lens of a telescope. That is what allows you to see that meteorite or the star in outer space. Because we actually converge the light rays to form an image. That image can be captured on the screen. And that screen is possibly the lens of the telescope. That's all. This one, there's a very complex question related to it. But I don't think we're going to go through it today. If I have time, maybe I'll bring it up later. Okay, It's actually in the worksheets for the regular classes. So you guys will see it. But later, if I got time, we talk about it. Why am I in such a rush? Because we need to try some questions. If today we go through the entire content without trying questions, we have failed. Because you need to get ready to answer questions that are coming up. Right? So what we're going to do is, given that you have the handout, in the interest of time, huh, I'm going to give you time to try the question. But you won't have forever. All right? So for each MCQ, I'm going to give you exactly one minute to attempt. If you cannot get the answer right away, it's okay. Because you actually have about one and a half minutes in the actual exam setting. All right. So my first thing I want you all to do here is to go ahead to try question one. Okay. If you know, you know. If you don't know, you're screwed. <laughs> so let's see how you guys do this. Okay, don't worry because I'll be sending the annotated copy in the chat after this as well. Okay, so I need everybody's buy-in here as well because I will answer your questions as well. But I'm sorry if I cannot answer everybody's question because ultimately we have about 50 of us. It's a pretty big class. I kind of have to move the lesson forward. Okay, but don't worry. If you have any questions, you can check with me after the class. Okay, but another 30 seconds. Let's see how you guys do.
Oh my god, I love your your gibbets. I see a lot of lapi xiao sing. Okay, answer for this question one, answer is B. But some of you, I tell you, I might give you the answer. I don't even know why it's the answer, right? True, right? So instead of talking about just the answer, we really have to go through the thought process or what should we be doing in order to get the answer, okay? I confess first, my drawing is going to be ugly. You guys better draw it with a ruler, okay? Your one will look nicer than mine. What is the correct situation to put this into. What do I mean? Uh? Among the six lens diagram, which one do you think it is going to look like? I very deliberately pause here. So what do you think? Which one? It is most likely the magnifying glass one. So what I need you to know, or at least if we go back here, do you see how we trace the light ray? So this light ray travels parallel first it converges and it bends. The way to trace your light ray is always, imagine you take out a ruler, straightening to the light ray's path, you will trace the dotted line backwards. Meaning, if we were to draw it out, how does this look? I try my best, okay? Imagine you're going to draw a dotted line. Actually, mine not bad already. Y'all cannot complain. This is quite good. Okay, then the other dotted line is straightening to this line. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? That's, that's what I mean. Lah, okay, your one will look nicer than mine, unless you didn't bring a ruler. <laughs> you can borrow. Okay, so the image that you're forming is here. Thank you, Jaden. You're right. U is lesser than F. So the main point I'm trying to make is that yeah, la, you can get your answer at all, but I need you to be able to do it the correct way, right? Why is it larger and why is it upright? It's because we're tracing backwards to locate this virtual image. By right, I'm not able to deduce purely from the diagram whether it's lesser than F or not. Why? Because we have no idea where your F is. But by tracing the light rays backwards to locate the image, now this becomes quite apparent we are looking at a magnifying glass. Okay, all of these are actual prelim questions from 2022. So we are not purposely trying to give you something very difficult. These are just more of the latest exam trend. Okay, if not, we'll give you the next minute to try the second question. Okay, go ahead and try this. Yes. Oh, if you take a look at the image that we have drawn, the object is pointing upwards. The image is also pointing upwards. Therefore, it is upright. If you form an image this way, then it's inverted. Same side, yes. Another rule you can go by is that if it's on the same side, it will be upright. If it's on the other side of the lens, it will be inverted. Can I? Otherwise, a minute for you all to try the next question. This is from the TYS. So even lesser excuse to get this one wrong. You are not required to calculate here. You're just required to identify R and see accurately. Okay, what's the answer? Is C, yeah? I'm going to like strangle some of you if you get this one wrong. Why? Uh? Remember remember this. Uh? I tell all my students the same thing across all the batches. We always focus on the normal. 
Come, Nicole, why is the normal so important? So what's the importance of drawing in the normal? To remind ourselves to do it. Right, to always remind ourselves that the angle that we're talking about is always between the light ray and the normal. So the normal serves as a reminder that, hey, I'm not going to use the wrong angle. For any of y'all that chose this one, why wow, you really need to go and pinch yourself now. Okay, never make the same mistake again. Right, as we said, it is always between the normal and the light ray. Next, critical angle based on your understanding should be the angle that allows total internal reflection to take place. Answer is C, uh, by the way. So if you're able to undergo total internal reflection, it means that your angle of incidence is greater than your critical angle. This one here doesn't tell you anything. This is not the critical angle. Remember, what are the two conditions for total internal reflection to take place? First one, it has to be traveling from optically denser to optically less dense. In this case, from the glass to the air. The second condition is that your angle of incidence must be greater than your critical angle. Remember the limit, right? Once you go past the limit, total internal reflection will occur. All right, so that's all for part C. Part C, question two, answer C. Let's move on to question three next. This one, I'm going to give you a full two minutes to try as it will involve some calculation. No calculator, how? <laughs> I'll finish already, nice. <laughs> okay, so this one, you will need to do some level of calculation. You asked about what if the speed of light in air, right? We talked about that just now. If the aircon is too cold, let me know, okay? We can always adjust it. Let me see who is here in class today. Hey, Tashwin is here. Nikita is here. Ido is here. Enrico. And so you made it. Hello, Jaden. Is this Joan or Joanne? Hey, Winston's here. Nice. Oh, Inkting's here as well. Oh, Ziona's here. Nice. Who is Zoom user? Oh my god, guys. I you come up with a better name than Zoom user. Okay, calculation-wise, I'm going to throw it to you guys instead, right? Instead of, I keep telling you what to do. What is the first thing we must do? Step one. Calculate one thing. What's the very first thing you have to do to unlock solving this question? Huh? What? The rest, anybody? Those online, eh, you want to tell me what is first step? Please, we have 50 brains collective together. Cannot be nobody know the answer. What's the first step? Yes, to calculate refractive index. And that is done by taking speed of light in vacuum over speed of light in medium. This is 3.0 times 10 to the power of 8. Ah. I purposely revised with you all just now because we needed to use it here. What is the speed of light in the medium? It is given, right? 2.5. You don't go and torture yourself by typing in 10 to the power of 8. Just take 3 divided by 2.5. Okay, you get 1.2. No, my math not that good. I typed my calculator just now. Okay, but now we know our refractive index is 1.2. More importantly, after we have found the refractive index, what do we need to do? After we find n, what should we use this n to find next? Find sine i? No, find critical angle. Ah. Going back to the formula earlier, sine 
sorry, n is equals to 1 over sin c, right? Why is it 1? It's because it's sin 90. If we rearrange this formula, sin c equals to 1 over n, equals to 1 over 1 1.2. Therefore, to find c, I need to inverse sign 1 over 1 1.2. Sorry, this one I cannot. You all need to save me. What's the critical angle? 56.4. Okay, let's just leave it as 56.4. Thank you so much. Now, with that being said, if my light ray comes in and it hits at an angle of 49, is this smaller or greater than a critical angle? It is smaller, right? Which means, what will happen? Will there be total internal reflection? No, right? Because I have to go beyond the critical angle for total internal reflection to take place. Remember, you talk back to your parents, you need to go past that critical point, right? Then it happens. This one haven't yet. Therefore, this is just a normal case of bending away from the light ray. Sorry, from the normal. Right, This is just a normal case of refraction. We have yet to hit the stage where total internal reflection will occur. Okay, So this is just a normal case of your FAST. As I go towards a faster region, I would bend away from the normal. So is this question easy? I think it's okay, provided your understanding is strong. There's a bit of calculation to be done, but that is normal. All right, let's move on to question four next. Okay, if you have your ruler with you, it might be good to try to draw. No harm. Okay, before I show you all the answer, once again, I apologize for the bad drawing, but too bad, you need to live with it. Okay, first things first, anybody confident enough to tell me what is point B? Like, what is it called? Sure. Uh, yes. So, what's the answer for question three? Question three? <laughs> question? Oh, shit, my thing is hanging. Sorry, guys, what's the answer for question three? D? D? Oh, D. Yeah, correct. Answer is D for question 3. Okay. Uh, sorry, going back to the point here, what is B called? Optical center. Very good. Optical center is the center of your lens. So for this question, I highly encourage you to draw in the lens first. Everything else is fake. Let's locate where the lens is. After that, what do we draw? I already mentioned this before, right? Usually for lens diagram, there are two light rays to draw. Light ray one cuts through the optical center. It's already given, right? Very nice light. What is the second thing we need to draw? The one that travels parallel before it will cut through to form the image. Wow, this one I stress. Take a deep breath. I can do this. Whoa! Oh shit, I'm pretty good at this. Not bad, right? Hey guys, can you give me some, some validation here? Very nice. Free hand, free hand. So is the answer C or D? It's neither. Lah. You get it? Because it's not cutting either C or D. So lastly, I need you to understand that this distance from here to here, this distance is called F. Which is the same distance from A to the center of the lens. So A becomes the answer. Yeah, because it cannot be C or D. It cuts the middle of C and D. I'm pretty sure if you draw it slightly better, it's actually right in the middle of C and D. Yeah, my, my one is already considered quite good already. First try, okay? But if you use a proper ruler to draw and it exactly converges at the image, 
it will cut in the middle of C and D. If you measure that distance, it actually traces back to A. So F, right, is here. F is also here. Okay? That is the principal focus. From the lens to the principal focus, we call that the focal length. So tell me this time your WA need to go in with a ruler? Of course. Okay, pencil also very important. Sometimes you're all damn confident, like, wow, I draw pen, ah, wow, that, that is shit is wrong, gone already. You cannot, you cannot erase it, right? So any diagram related stuff, always draw in pencil, right? Because you will make mistakes, right? So you're just giving yourself the correct. Okay, that's all for question four. So answer is A. Lastly, this was the one that I went through in my class last Thursday. All right, and Wednesday as well, I think if I had a chance to. Give it a try. So I better get this question correct. <laughs> this was the one we talked about last week. The one from Nicole's paper, right? Okay, same thing, one minute. We're going to give it a try. Hey, those with answers can type in the chat. We can see how many of you can get it right. Guys, is it BT sec or Betty sec? BT? Is it BT or Betty? The school name. BT, uh. Okay, well, I got 41 people online, only 4 people sending answers. Come, the rest, what are your answers? <laughs> Jaden, just imagine if you get this question wrong. GG, man. <laughs> okay, come. What's the answer? It's D, uh, all right? But more importantly, even if you didn't get it right, what's the working step, right? The solution is more important than the answer. Now, first thing we need to do is we need to draw the mirror adjusted by 10 degrees, all right? So what you need to draw is probably... Oh my God, sorry. The magic is gone. Sorry, I'm going to keep trying. I get this. Uh, one more time. Okay, 10. So this is 10 degrees. That means I adjusted my mirror by 10. I probably draw it a little bit too much, but y'all can draw it a bit better. Okay, you have a ruler. The most important step to do after this is to actually draw in the new normal meaning the normal that is 90 degree to the new adjusted mirror surface. Okay. So this one must be 90 degree to the surface, right? 90 degree. Therefore, if we take a look at the light ray and the normal, what is the angle over here? It is 10, which means since the incident ray and the reflected ray will be the same. I will undergo a reflection. And this angle over here would also be exactly 10. So what is the angle between the incident and the reflected ray? 10 and 10. Answer is 20. So the main thing is to draw in the new mirror position and the normal. After that, it's like everything flows already. You don't even have to worry. You are smart enough to solve it already. The main thing is you need to draw in the new mirror and the normal. The normal is the crucial one. Okay, with that being said, let's move on to the structured questions. All right, so for structured questions, unfortunately, my constraint is I don't have enough time. All right, but I still want to give you about two minutes to try this. After that, we'll go through. Okay, so two minutes to try question six, then we'll talk about it together.
Just curious, can those that are online right, try the annotate function for fun, uh, for fun. See if you can draw on the screen for the light rays. It'll be quite funny. <laughs> hey, but you don't need to draw properly, okay? Like, like the actual one that you'll be drawing. Okay, wait, wait. Uh. Oh, wait, guys. <laughs> oh my god. Clear all drawings. Okay, Ken, you can go ahead and play. Why got white color line one? Okay, two minutes, uh, two minutes. What is going on? Hi, don't worry. Later, I'll send the annotated copy in the group chat as well. Okay, so as long as you're in the Telegram group chat, you will get access to the recording after each class as well as the annotated answer sheet. Okay, one more minute. Okay, uh, as we look back on screen, all right, sorry for cutting down the timing. I wish I can give you all time, but I want to cover everything, okay? So the first one, I think is okay. Meaning I feel you should have a level of confidence drawing in the one that cuts through the optical center, as well as our light ray two, which travels parallel, followed by cutting through F. I think part A is not going to be a problem. After which you will then be able to locate where the image will be formed. So the image is always at the point of convergence. After locating the image, everything else is simple. Why do I say so? Because any light rays that passes through the lens originating from the object must go back to where the object is, uh, to converge back to the object. Meaning, this light ray here, all right, can you see it's from the top of the object? It will converge to the top of the image. Okay, actually, I think this light ray is wrong. Eh? This one is wrong. Wait, ah. Uh, it's not supposed to be here. Because this light ray originates from the bottom of the object, it will converge to the bottom of the image. This is the correct answer. You get it? It's not supposed to convert to the top of the image. If your light ray originated from the top of the object, it will converge to the top of the image. But if your light ray originates from the bottom of the object, it will converge to the bottom of the image. So ignore the answer sheet one. The school can be wrong, uh, don't worry. But I'll correct it when I spot it. Uh, the correct light ray is supposed to pass through this way. So if your light ray originates from, the, from A, that means the top of the object, it will always pass through the lens to converge to the top of the image. But if your light ray originated from the bottom of the object, 
after undergoing converging, it will converge to the bottom of the image. Okay, and lastly, part C, what happens to the image when the object OA is shifted slightly further away from the lens? So if I move my object further away from the lens, I want you to think in terms of similar triangles. What's going to happen? Will the image be bigger or smaller now? It will be smaller, right? Because now the object will form the bigger triangle, the image will form the smaller triangle. So without even having to memorize anything, we become absolutely clear that our image will become smaller than before. And in fact, it will form nearer to the lens. So those are the two changes that will occur. Now, similar triangles. Now you know a secret, guys. Okay, let's move on to the next question. For the next question, I'm not going to get you guys to do it. I just need you guys to read. Because this question here introduces Snell's law. Whatever I've highlighted over here, this is the famous Snell's law. It has to be provided because it's out of syllabus. Okay, so go ahead and read, and then we will take a look at this question together. Okay. You need me to scroll back up to the answer. Am I right to say you have no idea what's going on in this question? Hi, right. Okay. But it's hi in a way it's good lah, because now we got a chance to talk about it. So just now I mentioned that when we talk about the phenomenon total internal reflection, there is one official use case that is stated in the syllabus, ah, meaning you are supposed to know. All right. So what exactly do you need to know? You need to understand how the optic fiber works. The one that I was talking about, your 4G, 5G, right? How is data being transported? This is in the form of light, all right? But what is more important for you to understand is that the way an optic fiber is designed, the optic fiber, the inside is made of glass of high refractive index. The outside is made of a cladding layer with a slightly lower refractive index. So where I'm trying to bring you towards in terms of the understanding is that total internal reflection is possible because I'm traveling from somewhere that's optically denser to somewhere that's optically less dense. So because of the way the material type, the optical density, the way it's arranged, right, it's totally possible for total internal reflection to take place. So just imagine, right, my light just goes like that. You get it? So every time when I hit the surface, I undergo total internal reflection. So that way, my information captured in packets of data in the form of a signal is able to be transported rapidly at the speed of light. All right. So that's how the optic fiber works in terms of transmission of data. But the problem comes if you decide to bend the optic fiber. So optic fiber, you're not supposed to bend it. Because if you bend it over here, Instead of undergoing total internal reflection, what happened? It just underwent normal refraction. So you don't want refraction because refraction means your data are already. You want it to continue bouncing. Right? So that is the main idea of how the optic fiber works. The part that is going to destroy you is what I've pointed out as Snell's law. I'm going to spend one minute to explain it. After that, if you don't get it, it's okay because it's not in O-level syllabus. Now, at O levels, the formula that you have learned is N is equals to sine A over sine medium. I know some of you are still saying sine I over sine R, but hey, this is clearly better, okay? Uh, I don't have the time to prove to you it's better, but trust me, okay? 
I had known for too well that this is the better formula. But the thing is, the truth uh, is that this formula is actually incomplete. The correct formula actually looks like that. However, because at O level, you're only required to study refraction when it's between air and the medium, air becomes like the constant. There's always air. So refractive index is always comparing the medium to air. So it's always comparing to air. And as a result, N2 is always the refractive index of air. And do you want to guess what's the refractive index of air? It's 1. So instead of writing N1 over N2, we write N1 over 1. Then you might as well tell me, don't waste time, right? That's why you erase away this one. So that's how you end up with the formula at O levels, which is simplified lah, to N is equals to sine air over sine medium. Because your medium, your air is fixed. Then your medium is going to change. But the real formula doesn't just study with air because there's a possibility, as we see in your optic fiber, it's between two different mediums. It doesn't necessarily have to be between air and another medium. So the real formula actually looks like that, where the angle in A over the refractive index is A. So in a way, can you see it's like a cross? And this gives you your overall refractive index specific to between the two mediums. So if they want to test you at prelim or at O level, they must give you this formula. Your job is to put in the numbers. Let me show you in a very direct example here. It's not that hard, don't worry. Over here, this angle is for this medium. This angle is for the second medium. So I want you all to take a look at the question here, requesting for us to calculate the critical angle of the glass and the cladding boundary. So what we're going to do instead of jumping straight into this, I want to take a look at the formula again. Now, for me to calculate critical angle, my angle in my cladding has to be 90 degrees. Let me draw out the light ray to make it absolutely clear for all of us. It has to be something like that. Hey, wait, sorry. Something like that. I try my best. You get what I mean? So this is the scenario whereby if I heat it and my refracted ray in my cladding is 90 degree, I will be able to calculate what's my critical angle. Remember the relationship, huh? optically denser to optically less dense. So the angle in the optically less dense medium must be 90. Going back to this formula over here. So if I want to let this sine theta A, be my cladding, this will be sine 90, right? Because the angle in the less, uh, optically less dense medium must be 90. This Na or refractive index of A should be for the cladding, which is 1.51. So I'm just putting in the numbers. We're not doing anything special here. The refractive, sorry, critical angle would then be the angle in B. So I let this be sine C, and what's the refractive index in my glass is 1.69. So this is a direct application of the formula that we see over here. This is the angle in A. This is the refractive index. This is the angle in B, which is the critical angle. This is my refractive index. And from there, you're able to solve for C is equals to 63.3 degrees. Is this easy? No, this is bloody hard. But a bit of exposure is better than going in blank for your WA. I cannot guarantee it will appear. This. I don't know. I'm not God. All right? I have no idea. I cannot predict. But if it appears, I need you to have a fighting chance of getting it right. So remember, they cannot test you directly. They are required to provide the formula for you. Your job is to put this formula and apply it to the question. So as long as you have a good or decent enough understanding of how total internal reflection work, there's a strong chance you can apply and solve the question. Okay, like I said, if you're still very, very confused, you're like, what the hell, snail snow, I'd rather die, it's okay. Because it's technically not in the syllabus. Can it be tested? Obviously, this is a brilliant paper. All right, so I'm not trying to scare y'all, we're just trying to prepare y'all for it.
All right, so moving on. Part B, can you just help me write down as well? Over here, two conditions for TIR. Remember the one that I put a triple asterisk on? The moment a total internal reflection question appears and there's an explain question, you're almost guaranteed to bring up the two conditions for it, which is light has to travel from optically denser to the optically less dense medium. Angle of incidence has to be larger than the critical angle. And if the angle of incidence is smaller than a critical angle, refraction will take place. Meaning you haven't hit the threshold yet. You haven't hit the critical angle for total internal reflection to take place. So if that's the case, it's just your regular refraction instead. So I can give you a line hack here, what to focus on, focus on studying and making sure you understand the two conditions for total internal reflection. Because if I'm a school teacher and I really want to test you properly, I won't just stop at refraction. Man. I'll push it to total internal reflection. And if I want you to explain, the two conditions will automatically appear. There's, not, there's nothing else you can explain for total internal reflection. So it's confirm the two conditions. Okay, and once again, for clarity, for those of you who are confused, your regular classes will take place as per usual. These revision sessions are on top of your regular classes. Okay, so you don't kind of tell me, I went the WA and never do homework. No, uh, no such thing. Uh. Okay, you're supposed to do everything as per usual. This is a top up. Okay, WA2, we're going to expand to math as well. So there will be more coming. But this time we like, let's keep it manageable for you guys. <laughs> let's just do the sciences first. And after this, we'll be sending out a feedback form. You guys can let me, let us know lah, whether it's good, not good, what else you want to change. Then for WA1 and for your mock prelims, we can work to make it better. But we'll try our best to extend our support beyond just the subjects you're taking tuition for. Okay, let's move on to the next question. Oh, we're done. No more question. Nice. All right. So if not, let's go for a short five minute break. And when we come back, let's do some static. Okay, so five minute break, meaning we will resume at 8.57. Okay, people, it's time for static. I see a few people log off already. They're like, ah, screw static, it's not tested. Okay, anyway, the way I'll be going through static since just now based on the sense check is that most of you haven't learned it yet. I'm going to do this more as like an introduction to it, right? Rather than diving into the very granular details that you'll be completely like lost over, we just focus on like talking about, hey, these are certain things you need to look out for for static. Therefore, when you learn it in the future, it will not be as intimidating, all right? Here's the thing about static. As a chapter... I think a lot of students are scared of static. That means when you see this chapter, you're like, oh shit. Uh, it's a chapter that's very difficult to score. It's a chapter that's very complex. Some might even feel like there's a lot of things to like study or like memorize per se, right? But actually static is very logical. It's way simpler than it seems once you get the logic of how it works. Even for the question, the moment you get the logic, which I promise uh, today I only focus on the logic only, everything else makes sense. So the exact application of how things work, I don't want to care about that. We just talk about the general rules, including some questions and we can call it, and we can call it a day. All right. So I don't want you all to be too worried about this chapter. Now, with that being said, we focus on the rules. Rule number one. Number one. You must know unlike charges attract, light charges repel. Because like then you were like a bit like, you know what's called amateur. It means you secretly laugh. I already know that it's damn easy. Right? Like, what the hell, man? So it's true. But I think the emphasis here is to make sure that whenever you answer or when you explain, you have to bring this up. Charges do not move by themselves for no reason. So if you want to talk about, oh, the electrons flow in, the electrons flow out, you have to justify by saying it's due to the fact that unlike charges attract, therefore the electrons flow into the sphere. 
or because light charges repel, the electrons flow out of the sphere. So this is not so much that you don't understand, but it's emphasizing, hey, answering technique, it must be included in your answer. Later, we see if you all remember to put this simple face in, right? But this is one mark, right? If you don't put it in, it's very wasted. The second rule, the only other rule today, uh, this one is super duper important. Highlight this for me. Positive charges do not move. I repeat two more times. Positive charges do not move. Positive charges do not move. If we bring this back to chemistry just a little bit, I want you all to remember that your protons are stuck in the nucleus. So they cannot move. Lah. If anything, it's your electrons that are usually gained or lost, transferred or shared. So the electrons is like money like that. It's like I can pass here, pass there. Can transact, right? You can transfer me. I can pay now, you right? Stuff like that. But your nucleus, which is your brain, right? The number of protons inside. Like you cannot transfer people your brain cells, ma, right? So positive charges, die, die, ah, also cannot move. Meaning, if you ever see someone write, oh, the positive charge move, ah, as a teacher, I don't even read the rest of the sentence. It's just very really wrong. The whole concept is wrong. Okay? What I'm going to do for you, right, is I'm going to show you a O-level question. Just by these two facts alone, uh, you see if you can solve it. Okay, let me find a question for you. Okay, this is a question from 2016. You can spend a minute to read. I promise you, you can get the answer. As long as you listen for the past one minute. Very fast, right? Do you know why you can solve this in 10 seconds? I do it with you, ah, you see. Ah. Let's read the sentence. Ah. Positive charge. You get it? Can positive charges move? Cannot. Okay, statement B. Some positive charges move. But the some positive charges move. What's the answer? I don't want to have to care already. The moment you see positive charge move, it's straight away wrong. It's a rule. Positive charges cannot move. This is O level. Okay? Because if the positive charge can move, uh, a lot of these statements will start to make sense already. Oh yeah, a track. Wow, then you're like, why didn't you go through one big loop code? Then you're like, oh shit, sure, there's three correct answers. But you forgot the base rule, right? Which is this is the game. Positive charges cannot move. So what are the two rules of the game? Unlike charges attract, light charges repel, and positive charges cannot move. This anything is always the electrons. It is the negative charges that move. If you bear this in mind, the rest of the chapter becomes very easy, all right? instead of it being very complex. So that is rule number one. Now, of course, there are a couple of things we need to take note of, starting with the different ways of charging an object. So most objects by itself is neutral. How do we make it positively or negatively charged? When dealing with insulators, you just need to charge it via rubbing or friction. So the famous example is how we can transfer charges from a rod to a cloth. All it means is that friction will be able to transfer charges. I get you all to try something because in the past, uh, you don't judge me, okay? I'm just sharing my life story. At home when I'm studying, I got nothing to do. I'll take out a comb and then I start combing my hair. You don't judge me, okay? This is just what I did, okay? Then it helped me focus and I comb my hair. My scalp feels all healthy and all. But after that, right, if you take the comb and you put it nearer to a paper or tissue paper, it's actually able to attract those tiny tissue paper. It's because after friction between your hair and the comb, it's charged. So the charged comb now is able to attract a neutral object. That's all. So I'm just telling you via friction, uh, it will be able to charge an object. So in Singapore, it doesn't work. But uh, when you are staying overseas in a colder country and you wear a lot of layers, the wool, actually when you take off your clothes, you take off very fast, there's friction as well. So you actually charge and then you see all the mau mau on your jacket standing up because it's all charged, okay? But those are just very specific scenarios. Uh. My main point is that if you're dealing with insulators, it will be charged via friction. That's all. Now, the more annoying part uh, or the more dangerous part is how do you charge insulators? So the diagrams here are good enough, 
but I just prefer to use my own curated notes, all right? So I'm just going to go over to the curated notes. It is largely the same thing, lah, okay? It's just that this one is slightly more detailed. So how do we charge an object? First thing is charging via induction. So let's take a look at this scenario over here. Remember for me, first in, last out. Now, what do I mean first in, last out? Imagine you are the manager at a fast food restaurant. First in, meaning the manager is always the first to arrive. Everybody comes in after that, right? Then after the whole operation is done, your close shop, manager is the one that locks up. So first in, last out. So who is the first in, last out here? It's always the rod. In any situation, the rod is always first in and the last to take out. Because you will be given questions where you're tasked to sequence it in the correct order, or you might be tasked to write down the steps to charge an object. Just remember, no matter what happens, you always bring in the rod first, and you remove the rod last. Let's run through the logic of what has happened here. When you bring in the negative rod to two neutral metal sphere, what is the explanation for the scenario like that? Unlike charges attract. Okay, but what I tell you is wrong. I was baiting you all to say that anyway. Lah. But what if I tell you is wrong? Okay, here's, here's the part. Lah. This is the most important part for today's class. Okay, listen now. Lah. What was the second rule? Positive charges do not move. Now, what's the issue with us justifying that it's unlike charges attract? Is it really unlike charges? Yes. But was the positive charge attracted and move there? No. Okay. So listen, uh, I'm going to show you what has transpired. This one, I'm quite sure your school teacher won't teach it well. So you learn it here properly. The original scenario was that there were no charges. We have two neutral sphere. First in, I brought in the rod. Did my positive charges get attracted to the left side? No, right? What was the reason for saying that? Because positive charges cannot move. So the reason, or what actually happened is that when you bring in the negative rod, it is actually like charges that repel. I push my negative charges from the left side to the right side. Because the negative is like, I don't like you, ma, you are negative. I repel away from you. So all the negative charges, they ran over to the right side, leaving behind the positive charges on the left side. Confusing, right? I repeat one more time. Huh? Originally, it was neutral. When I bring in my negative rod, it wasn't unlike charges attract, but it was like charges repelling forcing my electrons to flush all the way to the right side, leaving behind my positive charges on the left. That's how I end up with my charge distribution as seen here. Because if you bring in a negative rod and you claim that unlike charges attract, you are saying that the positive charges move towards this negative rod, which is untrue and not possible because positive charges cannot move. It's a very minute difference, but it's the difference between a correct and a wrong answer. You're going, you're going to learn in school. You see, your teacher will explain like that. I trust you, they won't. Okay, they'll just say, uh, unlike charges attract, some of them teach wrongly. Okay? So please uh, remember, uh, positive charges cannot move. So in this particular scenario, I want you to read it carefully. Uh. I bring in the negative rod since... Sorry, it's lagging. Light charges repel electrons will travel away to sphere B. You get it? I never mentioned anything about positive charges moving towards the rod. Because the moment you do that, it is wrong. It's a misconception. Remember the two rules here. As easy as it seems, that is the reason why a lot of students make the mistake. Because they think, oh yeah, unlike charges attract. And that's very common. The first time you learn it, you confirm think that way. I'm really trying to adjust and twist the way you think. Okay, so even if you go back to school, you don't revert back to the norm. All right? You learn what is being spoken of here. It is correct. Stick with it. There are certain schools that will push you even harder. So for the Chongqing kids, right, your teacher will insist on talking about the forces of repulsion being stronger than the forces of attraction. So when I go through with your class, I will mention that. But that is a higher level answering technique. 
Not all schools will require. O level, do you need to write that? Don't need. But it is a good thing to write. You all get the difference? It's like gold standard versus O level standard. Yeah. So different schools got different requirements. But I will we'll talk about that in the future. All right. So this is the main thing I'm trying to bring across. The big one here, this is also another problem, uh, the word earning. Now, I know a lot of you haven't learned this chapter yet, but I just want to bring in the idea of earning. Earning basically means if you use a wire or you use your hand to touch a conductor, electrons are able to either move in or to move out freely. Okay, let's run through how this whole thing works slowly. First in, last out. What's the first thing that comes in? The rod, right? So the first thing I bring in is the rod. I have my negatively charged rod. Unlike charges attract? No, uh, light charges repel, right? So my electrons all get flushed over to the right side while leaving behind the positive charges on the left. The moment I connect a earning wire or when I earn it, I want you in your head to imagine that there is a ladder. You know those firefighters, they got those ladders? The ladder now allows either electron to go in or to come out. Now, what is the scenario between this set of charges and here? What's the scenario between them? Light charges. Repel, right? So if I give a ladder, right, what would the electrons do? They're all GTFO. They were like, I'm out. I hit this negative charge. I'm going to repel. I'm going to run away. So all of them will take the ladder and they will slide down. They will run out. So what is left inside the sphere is the positive charges. The last thing you remove is the rod. So what does Erding do? Does Erding guarantee electrons come in or go out? No. Erding is simply just a path for electrons to either go in or to come out. So it's like, I just give you the option. Now you have the ladder. Electron, if you want to come out, you can come out. Electron, you want to climb in, uh, you can also climb in. So imagine, right, I have a normal rod, sorry, a normal spear, and I put positive charges. And I give it a ladder. What will happen here is that the negative will be here, right? Because unlike charges attract, positive will be here. In this scenario, will electrons fly in or come out? Electrons will actually go in, right? Because this is positive, the electrons are attracted. So when the electrons come in, they will neutralize the positive charges on this side, ultimately leaving a net negative charge. Like I said, all of this you can go through in detail is uh, shown in the notes. When you learn in school, you also get a bit clearer. But the rule stands. Right, the two rules that we learned at the start, and additionally, how does the earning portion work? Earning gives you a pathway for electrons to flow in or to flow out. That's all. Okay, with that being said, right, I think we are actually pretty good with the chapter already because we're not really going into detail here. Electric fuel, yes, you need to know, but this one is actually quite simple. In fact, it looks eerily similar when you do magnetism. Because your north and south pole will behave in a similar manner. Just remember, between plus and minus, plus I have too much. I got excess. I give away. Lo. So the arrows originating from a positive charge is always going upwards. Can you see? It's always shooting up. But for negative charges, they will always be going in. Because I got not enough, huh? I got deficit. So I need to receive. All right. So in this sense, plus and minus, the excess will give to the one in the deficit. So that's the relationship or how you draw uh, electric fuel lines that shows your plus and minus charges. Okay, not very difficult, uh, this one. This one should be pretty straightforward. The hazards, we're not going to do it. Application, not as well. Not because it's not important, but it's because this is going into the detail. Instead, I'd like to use the last remaining 15 minutes to just guide you through some of the questions and the thought processes here. So the guidelines uh, that will keep you on track when you do the chapter. So let's start with question one. Okay, I'll give you a minute to read. I will not require you to do because you haven't learned it. Instead, I want to talk about the application. Like how do we do the question together? Okay, so this is the insights of a photocopier. Don't need to learn in detail. Focus on the big concept.
Okay, it honestly looks quite complex, right? But let's just focus on the things that you need to know. Over here is positively charged. This is the drum, right? So the drum is the thing that rolls. This is part of your printer. You all know what's the toner? It's not your skincare toner. This one is the powder toner, okay? So in order for the powder to stick onto the positively charged region, what charge must the toner have? Negative, because rule number one, unlike charges, attract. That's it. So if this is positive and the toner needs to stick onto it, it needs to be negatively charged. So what charge is your toner again? Negative, right? So if I want to stick onto the paper, once again, unlike charges attract, what's the charge of my paper? That's it. Huh? So this is just unlike charges attract. Very complex if you think too hard. Very easy if you just take the easy way out. Okay? So this is what I mean by thinking guidelines. Yes. Sorry? Paper is neutral. Yes, paper can either be neutral or charged. If it's... Good question, Reza. Can the paper be neutral? Yes. In those scenarios, they actually use heat to melt the powder onto the paper. That is totally possible. So you know when you use your printer or photocopier, usually the paper is a little bit hot, especially if it's a toner-based printer. Ink-based one doesn't matter. Ink-based is the damn so the zzz, 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 they, they go line by line. Yeah. The powder toner one is usually faster. The large-scale printing kind is usually via that. So the paper need not be charged. In fact, if you refer to your curated notes, the paper is neutral and is melted onto it via heat. Yeah, that's how it works. Okay, next question. Give you 30 seconds to read, guess, and you probably still get the wrong answer, but we can talk about it together. Answer B C A. <laughs> no, I no, said so one person take one, right? A B C D, right? <laughs> okay, it's okay. Answer is D. Yeah. <laughs> okay, but more importantly, let's explore why. All right, I go through the correct answer first. Maybe we can talk about why the other answers are wrong as well. Now, if I have positive charges, what is rule number one again, guys? Unlike charges, attract, right? So the rule here makes sense because, well, I have my positively charged sphere. Surrounded by it are the negative charges. Now, if you go like, okay, Joe, I kind of get it. I'll say a natural question that you should be asking is, sure, I get unlike charges attract. I'm not stupid, ma, right? But why is C wrong then? C is the same thing, right? We see a ring of positive inside. That means my spear is positively charged. Then outside here is negative one. Sure, correct one. Unlike charges attract, what's wrong? The outside, there is positive. Here's the killer question. Why, what happened to the positive charges on the outside? Did the positive charge move somewhere? Guys, it's a trick question. Did the positive charge move somewhere? No, positive charge cannot move, right? So what happened to those positive charges? Okay, listen up. Huh? Since my sphere is positively charged, it will attract electrons. Remember the ladder? We had the ladder here. So if I put a ladder, would electrons be rushing in or rushing out? Rushing in, right? Because I got suddenly a, imagine a ball ball, right? Drop from the sky, it's positively charged. Then all the electrons are like, yay, then they all run towards it, right? So that's what happens when we say unlike charges attract. So with my electrons all dashing in, 
what do you think they will do? They will go and neutralize all of it. So the electron match up to the positive. And once you have plus and minus and they neutralize, meaning they cancel each other out, it disappears. You get it? So if you keep making it disappear, disappear, the positive charges on the outside will no longer exist. So the only thing that is there is the globe of positive and the electrons that are attracted by it. That's the only thing that's holding it there. Anything on the outside has been neutralized already. That's why I say this chapter is not hard, but the way you think about it has to be very specific. Let's try another option here. If this is negatively charged, what's going to happen with my ladder? All the electrons is like time to GTFO, right? It's like, I hate this. I'm going to repair. I'm going to tell already, right? They all take the ladder. They slide down. So what will be left behind in the can? Positive charges on the inside. You get it? I'm telling you all why A is wrong. Lah. Rather than, you know, just going over it like, this is the reason why it is wrong. It's because the electrons will flush out. You will leave behind positive charges. If I want to be like super duper A now, like some of your school teachers are, did you notice that I draw in exactly six positive charges? Why? Because the sphere got how many negative? Six. There is this thing called the conservancy of charges, meaning the charges must match and look the same. Okay, so this is just me being like, I want the best for you. So I'm telling you, there's a reason we count the charges as well. Some schools don't penalize, some schools will. But if you ask me, if you take physics with me, I will penalize. Because we are going for the gold standard. La. That means we don't play play. La. Okay? So some schools will penalize you. We might as well all move ourselves to that level. Okay? So that's for question two. So answer here is D. Uh, how I know the sphere is positively charged is because around the sphere is positive charges. So this implies that we're looking at a positively charged sphere. Okay, question three is quite easy. We're going to do this together. If my electric field lines are going towards Q, is Q plus or minus? You got too much money or too little money? Too little, right? That's why you need to receive donation. Huh? Right? So Q here is negatively charged. If R is moving away from Q, R is getting repelled. So what is the rule here? And Un unlike charges, re <laughs> light charges repel, right? So what must R be? R is negative. And this one's okay. This one shouldn't be a problem. All right, moving on. Okay, give yourself a chance to try. I give you one minute. All right, if you can't get it, it's fine, right? But give yourself a chance to look at the different patterns. This one is not jury design. Uh. This one, you need to know how the charges will move. Alright, before I forget, guys, let's take a selfie and post on the group to show that we were here today for people that Park say us. Ready? Three, two, one. Let me post onto the group chat. My my caption would be we are supposed to have 16. <laughs> But then again, there's like 30 plus people online. Okay, 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 you guys are still with me. Okay, answer for question four. Let's take a look. 
The answer for question four is C. All right, let's study what has happened. If you have a negatively charged sphere, positive charges appear on this side. Unlike charges attract, true or false? Oh yeah, my positive charges got attracted to the negative charge and moved to the left side. Red flag, right guys? So what is the real thing that has happened here? Light charges repel. The charges here is like, bro, I hate you, man. They all run away to the right side, leaving behind the positive charges on the left. You get it? So it's like our tendency is what? Unlight charges attract. Very normal. I'm dying to correct your thought process here. Is, is it true that unlight charges attract? It is true. But what happened here wasn't about unlight charges attracting. It was about light charges repelling. Okay, very small difference, but it's a difference between a correct and a wrong answer. Okay, so I hope this is clear. Now, if you put three conductors side by side like this, you can almost think as though it is one big object. That means instead of thinking like, oh, they will be distributed and stuff, charges are allowed to move freely between conductors. So when you put three spheres together side by side, it's the equivalent of having just one big. Meaning the left side is all the plus, the right side is all the minus. Okay? So I need you all to know that that's how it works. Okay? And to end off today's lesson, we're just going to do the last MCQ and we call it a day. Let's take a look at the final question. Um, if you printed your worksheet early, there was a bit of a typo, but I already changed for most of you here to P and Q. All right? Stick to the question. The typo version that I sent earlier was like Q and R or something. Okay, last question before we call it a day. Answer. Ooh, very good. Answer is C. Yeah. But more importantly, let's run through the thought process. When I bring in my positive rod, first in, last out. All right, let that be clear. So when I bring in my positive rod, what will happen is that my electrons will be attracted. Unlike charges track, they'll move to the left side, leaving behind the positive charges on the right. Think of P and Q as they are in contact as one giant sphere. All right. Next, by introducing your erding, remember the erding is a ladder for electrons to flow in or to flow out. With a positive rod in place, would electrons be rushing in or coming out? Electrons will be like, hey, I want to go in. I want to get closer to the positive. Unlike charges attract. What these electrons will do is that they would neutralize the positive charges on the right side. So at the end of the day, when you finally separate the spheres, followed by removing the rod, you are leaving behind what we call a net negative charge on P. So net negative, meaning now you have excess negative charges. While Q upon neutralization is neutral. Because all the electrons that you brought in got rid of the plus. So it's just normal, so it's neutral. For most objects that get up, they'll end up being neutral. Okay, then the plus, that side is the minus. If you study this more deeply, the exact terminology to describe this method is induction plus erding. Yeah, but at the moment now, I just need you to get the logic rather than to go into the details of each charging method which you can find in your notes, right? Today's handout, all right? But more or less, uh, I'll say this is what's important. The reason why I didn't go through the structured questions is because the structured questions are a little bit more complex 
I feel like if you haven't fully learned the chapter, uh, it will be quite difficult to follow. The good news is I will send the answer sheet, the annotated version into the group chat. So feel free to go and look through the questions or when you start to learn the chapter. Uh, but all in all, I hope you all had a good revision session today. I confess I wasn't able to go very in-depth into every single thing that I want to cover, right? But I hope we at least touch on the most important parts and the things that you really need to know lah, when you go and take your WA, especially for light, right? Things that we have described, total internal reflection, how you look at lenses. It's really about the way you study physics rather than physics being... Physics don't need to memorize one, guys. If you ever think that physics is something to memorize, please, no need, okay? Because there's really nothing here. Everything is very concept-based. It should be very logical. Okay, if not, uh, if you all need further practice, go and do your TYS law. Okay, other than that, my class students, please, I'll see you as per usual for this week's class. Class is not cancelled. This is just additional revision because uh, the overmark tutors, we are a bit obsessed with you all doing well in school. So additional revision is always a good thing. Okay, if not, uh, that's all for today and I will see you guys. Uh, the other revision sessions will also be recorded and uploaded. So if you miss the session, don't worry. Or if you have tuition and the timing, don't worry as well. Okay, but thanks for spending your Monday night with me. Goodbye.